right, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are at in the world uh, right now as you're listening and watching this. My name is Felipe Hinojosa. I am the editor for Latinx Talk. Latinx Talk is an online interdisciplinary peer-reviewed and moderated forum for the circulation and discussion of original research, commentary, and creative work in brief and diverse formats, uh, essays, artwork, video format like we're doing here today. Uh, today, it is my distinct uh, pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Max Crockmull to uh, our video book series where we highlight books in the field of Latinx studies. Um, and it's just a, a, a real honor for me to talk to Professor Crockmull today. And the topic of discussion is uh, his 2016 award winning book, Blue Texas, the Making of a Multiracial Democratic Coalition in the Civil Rights Era. If I were to list for you all, all of the awards that the book has won, we would never get to the interview. So just know uh, it's, it's, it's been a well-received uh, book. And so uh, let me do a quick introduction uh, to Professor Crockmall. He is Associate Professor of History and Founding Chair of the Department of Comparative Race and Ethnic Studies at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, his research examines coalition building among African American, Chickenex, Latinx, and white community organizers across the long civil rights era from the 1930s to the 1980s. Professor Crockmall, welcome to Latinx Talk. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. All right, all right. So let's just jump right in here and get started. Um, first of all, uh, this is a fabulous book. What brought you to the topic and why Texas? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I guess I came to the topic uh, having been an organizer in the labor movement in California and elsewhere, uh, and as well as engaged in different types of community organizing. And it was really clear to me, um, working in the, in the SEIU, you know, which is a progressive union, a union that was interested in, in creating sort of workplace democracy, um, it was, it was interesting to me to discover the limits to that progressive vision, right? And particularly the ways in which our union had failed um, to address the needs of our members beyond their work lives, um, the way in which we were not very good partners when it came to coalitions with civil rights groups and, and back then, you know, anti-war organizing that was happening. Um, you know, it was like we wanted them to show up when, when we needed them but we didn't always go out and do the work of, of, of being out in those communities and fighting for the whole lives of our members, whether that's around housing or whatever. Um, so I was interested, you know, in having learned some, uh, you know, about the civil rights movement um, and, you know, and about doing anti-racist work within labor settings about where the connections would be between unions and, and civil rights. Um, it was important to me that having come out of California, that that be a multiracial, multi-ethnic story, that the world was not black and white and really never had been. And, um, and, and yet at the same time, I was sort of fascinated with the, the structures of formal Jim Crow um, and with the, the organizing tradition that, that Charles Payne had written about that I'd read as an undergraduate right, coming out of SNCC and elsewhere. And so you know, I, I was interested in, in sort of the formal Jim Crow South. I was interested in, in Chicano Latino studies. Um, and I had this question about labor and civil rights and their intersections. And so that all brought me to Texas as, as the historical laboratory for, for those questions. Um, you know, I, I thought it was interesting that living on the coasts, right, there's so much um, confusion and just uh, misunderstanding about everything in between, right? Uh, and it was clear to me coming out of the Bay Area, right? That if we wanted a um, broader political change in America, we needed to, to know what was going on in places like Texas. And we needed to think about how does organizing occur in a place like Texas? What history was there uh, of insurgency in these places? Um, and, and sort of recover that story as, as a opportunity to, um, you know, empower further change, so. So you yeah. mentioned uh, uh, your California roots. Where in California? You mentioned the Bay Area, born and raised? Yeah, well, I grew up in Reno, Nevada, actually. Um, okay. And which is, a, you know, a diverse place um, and, a, and a poor place. Um, and my, my own upbringing was from a poor white working class family there um, and a Jewish family. But we ended up in, in I ended up going to college at UC Santa Cruz and then okay. um, working in the labor movement in the Bay Area. Um, and in Salinas. So yeah. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. That's great. 
you know, one of the things that I came away, um, you know, quite impressed by um, was that this is a big book and um, it, it has uh, received a lot of acclaim. It tells a story that a lot of people I think have overlooked, especially looking at Texas history. There's an idea of Texas that we have uh, in our minds and in maybe the collective psyche of the country that this is a conservative place. Everybody's walking around with boots and cowboy hats and that sort of thing. And you tell a radically different story, especially focused on the urban centers of San Antonio um, and Houston. One of the things you do very, very well that I really appreciated was that even though it's a big book, you don't sacrifice storytelling uh, and the focus on just ordinary folks, um, you know, doing the work that they're doing. Um, I'm sure as a history professor, you probably get from students, maybe colleagues, maybe people that you um, work with in the community who often are asking you who is um, who is our Chavez, Cesar Chavez kind of big sort of figure? What do you tell uh, your students or what do you tell folks in the community about the power of, of ordinary people organizing and doing the work? Yeah, right, good question. So, I mean, I, I'd say first it's, it you know, who's the next Chavez is the wrong question, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that folks aren't gonna be liberated by some, some great emancipator, but rather it's the capacity of, of ordinary people to come together and um, discuss what's going on in their lives, uh, test out new ideas for how to fix problems that they're confronting, um, and then and then do it right and and take that action together and then and then learn from what happens and, and adjust. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that's the first part is like who's 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 gonna who's gonna create, you know, liberation or democracy. It's it has to be ordinary people coming together to, to do that work. You know, that said, the book is full of heroes and, and heroines, right? People who, um, you know, are have, have been lost to history and I help to, you know, bring out of the, the shadow of the archives and put on the page and, and tell their story. And, and so it's a really exciting to see, you know, activists who, um, who aren't well known, right? But that who made these, you know, tremendous impacts and, and you know, so for 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 your listeners, right? Some of the some of the folks in the book that jump out, of course, early on is Emma Tenayuka of San Antonio. Right. She's well known, um, and I tell her story, but I kind of come at it at a different angle, in part because I didn't want to tell the same story, right? But um, you know, there was, for example, Alberta Snid Cepeda, Cepa, Cepeda, excuse me, who um, was one of she grew up in this garment in this in this pecan worker strike, and later became a leader in the garment workers union and in uh, in the Chicano movement in, in, in San Antonio. Um, so what did this what did this famous strike, this uprising look like from the perspective of an ordinary working person in, in the thick of it? So we try to tell that story a little bit. Um, moving forward in the book, um, I, I, I spent a few pages at least with John J. Herrera, who yeah. was an activist in Houston in the 1930s and 40s and, and beyond. And, um, you know, uh, a story that was sort of lost to time, you know, Herrera formed uh, a coalition electoral partnership with progressive Anglos and African Americans in Houston, right as far back as the 1940s. Um, and then, uh, you know, a major player that shows up in the book is Albert Pena of San Antonio. And, um, yeah. you know, people might not know Albert Pena, he's not a household name. Um, but, uh, you know, he probably did more to organize uh, and create what we now think of as the Latino vote. Uh, than, than any grassroots organizer in Texas or maybe in the nation. And, um, and one of the stories that, you know, he, he became a very central figure in the book um, because he was such an um, effective uh, uh, trainer of other leaders as well. Mm -hmm. um, and also because he operated based on, um, uh, you know, a, a deep commitment to, to liberal ideas and, and in particular a commitment to civil rights and a willingness to form partnerships with black civil rights activists. And so that became a central theme in the book. Um, you know, Albert Pena helped to give us Henry B. Gonzalez as a public figure, right? Uh -huh. um, and um, one could argue now, he, you know, Julian Castro and, and, and Joaquin Castro are, are uh, part of his legacy as well. How did you go about with all of these folks that you're that that you're mentioning here and bringing out, and I know with some of them you were able to do oral history interviews and meet with them personally. Others, 
uh, it was in the archive or even previous um, oral histories that others had done. How did you find some of these folks? How did you go about doing that work? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I want to back up and just tell you a little bit about the research and the, how I got there. Yeah, so, sure. Um, one of the early stories I discovered was of a, um, a radical union of packing house workers in Fort Worth um, at the armor plant here on the north side. Um, and this is like a, you know, an outpost of the Chicago operation, but um, they formed a union there in the 1940s. And it was kind of a, a normal union, but by the 1950s, it actually became more radical, right? It's a strange story. <laughs> where in 1954, it elects a, a Mexican-American woman as its president of this 1,400-member diverse union. It elects an African-American man as the district director of the whole of the Southwest region based here in Fort Worth. And, um, and so I was really interested in these kind of workplace stories, right? And I thought, okay, I'm going to follow more of those kinds of workplace stories, and I'm going to try to understand what did segregation look like on the shop floor, right? Which, which side of the cafeteria were the Mexicans sent to, right? What did that mean? How did, what does that tell us about race in America in this period? And I kept asking those questions. But what I found was that most of those leads went nowhere, or they were very localized little stories, and I was having trouble thinking about where they connected. One place that they sometimes connected were in the labor councils, right? The, the local federations of different um, unions coming together. They'd sometimes send delegates. But what, what surprised me was that um, when I started following these people around, um, they were just obsessed with partisan politics, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And um, particularly with an intra-party fight within the Democratic Party for control of the Democratic Party. And I, I remember thinking, having come out of the labor movement as a radical myself, oh man, what a waste of time, right? What are they doing? And, um, but then I kept reading it and I kept banging my heads against these, these records that talked about the political arena and the work that these activists were doing there. And suddenly it occurred to me, oh, this is where the action is happening. Mm. Oh, it turns out I have to write a political history, which was not what I set out to do. Um, and, yeah. um, and so I started seeing the same names to get to your question. I see the same names popping up at the, at the Labor Council or at the, at the PASO meeting and at the Democratic Party meeting. And then I noticed the same names popping up at the NAACP meeting and the Democratic Party meeting. And it was like, okay, well, I have these people in a room together. Now I'm yeah. going to follow each of them and see where they go. And, uh, and then I would try to interview them if they were alive, or if not, I try to find their, their known associates and their family members and their kids. Um, or I would depend upon some of the great previous interviews done by George Green and Jose Angel Gutierrez, uh, both of which were, were archived at UT. Yeah. Uh, UT Arlington, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting to me to sort of get at you know, the, the entire process of not only, you know, um, telling the story that you want to tell, but then meeting those points in the archive where you're like, wait a minute, I got to pivot, I got to go somewhere else. Yeah. And then having having it be directed um, by what you're finding by the documents and then going and talking to the folks uh, themselves. Um, I wonder, th that sort of takes me to my, my next question in terms of um, process. Um, you start in the 1930s and you end with La Marcha in 66. Tell us about why those bookends or why that time period is so central to uh, Texas history in particular, but I think you're saying something also bigger about coalition politics just in general. Yeah, good. Um, so, I mean, so the, you know, the, if the big picture question was, is there a, a radical organizing tradition in Texas, right? And um, I had the good fortune of studying with, with the late, great Larry Goodwin, who chronicled the populist uh, uprising and the farmers' alliances in Texas in the 1880s and 90s. Um, mm. And so I knew there was something there. And in fact, um, yeah. I knew there was even a connection between that and later stuff, right? But in the early 20th century, Jim Crow and Juan Crow had taken over, right? They'd been imposed yeah. from above, you know, through terror, through violence. And... Um, and even though there was always resistance to those regimes, um, the first major crack really appeared during the 1930s, right? The 1930s, because of the depression, because of um, the federal government intruding into the affairs of Texas, right, in the Jim Crow South, um, that it created an opening, right? A, a sort of political opportunity moment, right? Where, um, where activists could, could feel as though they might get some support from outside, uh, where there was, um, uh, just a, 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 I guess, a, a destabilizing of, of these um, 
industrial arrangements and the arrangements of Jim Crow and a political yeah. domination. So one, one manifestation of that was the growth of a self-identified dissident liberal wing within the, the Democratic Party, right, which had been the party of segregation right. and remained so, but there was now a, a competing faction among white liberals um, who were committed to the New Deal and to the National Party. There was the rise of the CIO, right? A new kind of labor movement that was going to be inclusive uh, in, in sometimes, right? And at least offered opportunities for black and brown workers. And, and, and those folks voted with their feet and joined the unions overwhelmingly whenever they had the opportunity to do so. Um, and then we see, you know, a major lurch forward in the civil rights movements, both African-American and Mexican-American for the same reasons, right? That they suddenly had a state that once in a while could be counted upon to intervene on the on the side of justice. And um, so, so that was one set of reasons, I guess, yeah. you know, I, I, I came up through grad school at Duke um, and was around a whole bunch of civil rights historians uh, in the wake of, of Jacqueline Hall coming up with the concept of the long civil rights movement and the debate that stemmed from that, that presidential address and article. And so the, you know, the, there was a lot of questions around well, where does the civil rights movement begin and what kinds of institutions was it located in? And, um, and particularly, are there continuities between this uh, first phase of, of the long freedom struggle in the 30s and 40s and, and what occurs in the 50s and 60s? Um, yeah. So that was one set of questions I brought to the project. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I studied with, with Bob Korstad who had written about one of these civil rights unions in, in, in North Carolina. and. Um, right which I'm still actually writing about again now. Um, but, but um, you know, the story there was that there were no continuities, right? That the movement had been crushed, that the Cold War had, had discredited those activists and spit them out. And, and, and the story that Korstad and Lichtenstein had told lots, lots earlier was about, um, you know, how the African-American freedom struggle really lost its edge when it came to questions of class and economic justice and it moved its physical location from the union hall to the to the church. Um, yeah. And I none of that sat very well with me, I guess I could say, as an organizer, it didn't make a lot of sense to me that people could be crushed that completely um, and or that the, the entire economic vision of the movement might disappear. Um, you know, and and so I wanted to probe that question and see what what connections there might be. What did, what would it look like if you focused on ordinary people, if you told a history from below? What would the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s look like? And then I think, well, I'll just say quickly, a similar yeah. story among, among Mexican Americans, right? We had Saragosa Vargas's works coming out about the 1930s and 40s. Um, and he kind of posited, oh yeah, there's this connection with the later movement. Um, but everything you read about the 1950s was about LULAC, right? right. And it was about the GI right. Forum. And um, and you know you don't see that sort of radical edge reappear until the late 60s to the Chicano movement and the Black Power movement. So I was interested in this period in between and wondering if you if you if you got to the level of of working people and 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 sort of grassroots activists in this you know very repressive part of the country, right? Yeah. What what would you find? Right, um, right. And yeah. and I was just going to interject there really quick yeah. and ask you about you know you write about you know the moment in the years after World War II where, you know, as you were sort of uh, talking about these movements being decimated and McCarthyism and all kinds of claims of communist infiltration and communist connections and so forth, but you offer a different story. There's a pivot, there's something, there's a turn there. Who's a part of that? Is that Peña making that happen in San Antonio? Is that sort of contributes to the rise of Henry B? And um, because I just found that really fascinating to sort of reorient and have us think about that moment that we have, for the most part, at least in Chicano history, as you know, thought about it as very sort of uh, homogeneous, right? I mean, there's it's it's the Mexican American generation, and the Chicano generation doesn't come until you know at least sixty five or later, right? Um, yeah, and then the other part that's bound up in that is the whole debate around race and about whiteness, um, right? And and supposedly the fifties are the moment in which. Mexican American whiteness strategies are, are dominant and triumphant and um, and almost the exclusion of everything else, right, in, in the literature. And um, so, yeah, right. Um, I wanted to test that theory too, right? I had this story from San Antonio where these Mexican, I mean, sorry, from Fort Worth, from the shop floor where Mexican and black workers are coming together and 
um, and fighting the color line in the cafeteria together, right? And I was like, well, how generalizable is this? How much can I think about this in other places? And um, so what we see, as I mentioned in Houston, right, there were these early coalitions between, um, between John Jay Herrera and uh, certain African-American activists. The Cold War didn't crush them. They found ways to carry forward. And in San Antonio, um, there had been earlier organizing as well in the 1930s. One of the, one of the stories I tell around the pecan sheller strike um, was that there was in fact a multiracial coalition emerging in San Antonio in the late 1930s. Um, and that uh, uh, a certain black radical named G.J. Sutton was connected with, with the pecan sheller movement and with the campaigns around Maury Maverick. And, um, and so yeah, Sutton was you know, affiliated with the National Negro Congress. Um, you know, with a bunch of other sort of popular front mo moments uh, and, and organizations. And coming out of World War II, um, he and others are able to continue that, that struggle forward. Um, yeah. And so he forms a coalition with Gus Garcia in 1948, and they run for school board and for the community college board together and, and win, right? And then that scares San Antonio into a whole bunch of um, uh, changes designed to repress the, the growing majority of black and brown people. Um, so yeah, you know, Albert Pena comes along in 19, in the early 1950s, he's a World War II veteran. Um, he he kind of, you know, becomes a lawyer, he gets involved in precinct organizing while in law school in Houston, right? He learns it in the labor movement, essentially, and, and yeah. comes back home to San Antonio and realizes he doesn't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> and um, and he, he stays a lawyer, and he, and he, but he gets more and more involved with the GI Forum and yeah. with LULAC. But his version of those organizations is nothing like how they appear in the literature, right? He's yeah. he's out there knocking on doors. He's out there building political power. He's, um, you know, my favorite story. One of my favorite stories in the whole book is he goes down to Hondo. He's he is asked to go down there to to help with a school desegregation case, and um, and he files the lawsuit and he's doing everything a good lawyer, you know, with a suit on in the Mexican American generation, everything he's supposed to be doing. Right? And of course, the case doesn't go anywhere because that's how lawsuits work. And, um, and the parents start getting pissed off at him and wishing, you know, blaming him that nothing's getting done. So eventually he goes down there and he stumbles upon a direct action strategy, right, where they just go and try to register the kids. And when they get turned away, they go to the back of the line and they do it again and again. And by the end of the day, the school district's on the phone with the TEA and the school's desegregated, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, and so it's like proof, oh, okay, there's these this confrontational approach, right? Yeah. It's yeah. not just about respectability. It's going to be about power. It's going to be about confrontation. It's going to be about coalition building. And, um, and so Albert Pena and, and with his wife, Olga Pena, develop a, 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 a sort of ground game, a strategy for how to actually build power on the ground. And then, as you said, it, it, it helps to elect Henry B. Gonzalez yeah. and eventually Pena himself. I think one of, the, one of the ways that you put it is that in the book is that there's a there's a concern for justice, not just for order. I yeah. Think, if, I, if I remember correctly, paraphrasing there your words, that really stood out in terms of um, kind of the overall structure and the methods and, and what they were doing uh, uh, and so forth. So well, listen, I have to go back to what you said earlier at the beginning of your statement. Is there a radical tradition in Texas? Obviously, after reading your book, you I am convinced you've got me uh, I know your readers will be convinced as well. What kind of reactions have you been getting when you say that sort of thing from people that are, you know, eh, <laughs> or haven't read the book yet? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's funny. One of my readers early on said that I was I would that the that the book was um, rehabilitating American liberalism in this period, and I was like, man, that was the last thing I set out to do. Um, <laughs> but I think what I do show is that you know, even in the confines of Cold War liberalism. Yeah, um, these activists were um, engaged in uh, in the radical project of extending it uh, in ways that its framers sure. never anticipated. Right, in bringing it to the South, to Texas, um, and most importantly, right, to breaking breaking it open for African Americans and Mexican Americans. Right, uh, the the you know the New Deal really was never designed to serve. Um, yeah. So they're breaking open the the American liberal state, and I I do think it's radical, especially for the time. Right, that they. You know the activists I write about were engaged in constant, protracted intra-racial conflicts. Right? Um, they're the so-called race leaders, uh, African American, Mexican American, were constantly at their throats, telling them, you know, don't be out there marching. 
don't be out there allying with liberal whites because you're, you know, you can get more jobs this way or whatever it might be. And, um, and they, they really eschewed, um, you know, all of the notions of what respectable politics looked like at the time. And that the reason they did was because that was a politics of tokenism and of gradualism. It was a politics in which they were structurally disempowered. And, right. um, and so for these activists, for G.J. Sutton, for Albert Pena, um, you know, for others like them in the book, you know, it became very apparent to them. And I don't know where they got it, right? I, I'm not sure exactly how, how it was in their, in their constituency, you know, it, it, internally. But they just said, no, we're not doing that. We want independence. We want self-determination. You know, the things that became the rallying cry later on. Right. Yeah. They were already talking about it in 1940s, right? Right. saying, right. if we if we don't get to determine this for ourselves, we have no power. We don't get to right. vote. There's no yeah. reason to go elect some Uncle Tom or Tio Taco. Right. We need we don't need brown faces in high places. They, they wanted the ability to shape their own future. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's very clear that there's this radical tradition in, the, in, in Texas, you know, in the places we wouldn't look. And I think it's in part because we we have. Um, We've not tried to look right. We 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 uh, we're we're lazy. <laughs> we take the the you know the guy who says I'm the president of Lulac and gets up on a soup bo- soapbox and says whatever he says. Okay, well there's the spokesman for the Mexican race, right. um, as though there is such a thing, right? right? And and there isn't. And I you know one of the one of the things I think I really wanted to do with the book was to explode these ideas of of these rather lazy intellectual ideas of. A community, right? Yeah, um, right? And instead, show how these communities w- were fractured, and how um, that wasn't always a bad thing. And in fact, it presented um, new possibilities and opportunities for organizers um, who who came to discover sometimes that they um, that they that their affinities, you know, with people across racial lines were were stronger than they they might be with their self appointed leaders. Um, in, so yeah, intra racial. Uh conflict leading to interracial coalition building right exactly yeah right and and yeah. you know I, um and so there yeah there were in the 1950s there were these mexican leaders who thought they were white right um or who at least used the whiteness strategies sure um but there were these other mexicano leaders who you know understood that no matter what it said on their birth certificate right like they were being treated like crap right and um yeah. And that even though their experience was very different from African Americans across town, that there was enough in common that they could find ways to work together. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I think um, you know the young radicals in the, in the later '60s when they come along, they they kind of say, "Oh man, everything our parents are doing is bullshit," because that's what young radicals always say. Young people, period, right? Um, <laughs> But as it turns out, like some of their elders were doing this very kind of organizing in, in very hostile climate, you know, much earlier. And in some cases, there are direct continuities, even in terms of how this generation of, of radicals in the Cold War period, you know, they called themselves liberals, they were liberals, but they were trying to expand liberalism. Yeah. They become the direct mentors of some of the youth radicals uh, of the 60s and 70s. Yeah, yeah. Um, when, when, when I, you know, reading the book, um, it, it was, you know, clear that much of the kinds of tensions, conflicts that the, the, you know, these radicals that you write about here are going through in the forties, fifties and early sixties resonates with today. And one of the things that I think you do really well throughout, uh, again, is just reminding folks of the kind of work process that went into this. Um, you know, you have a section there towards the end where you talk about lessons for today. We are in, um, uh, you know, as I, we've all sort of been living in this really difficult moment, um, you know, with the pandemic, uh, police brutality, pr- police murders of black men uh, and brown men and other folks uh, and women as well. Um, that has sort of raised the tensions to where now <laughs> there are legislators talking about critical race theory as if it were something new, right? Uh, and going after it in that way. Um, I wonder if you, you know, I know sometimes as historians, we're always looking in the past, but you do really well here to sort of pitch us a future of what it might look like and how we think about it and what it might mean to turn Texas blue, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I wonder if you have, based on the research, um, you know, what are some tips? What are some things uh, you're an organizer yourself 
um, you know, you're in, the, in this movement involved and so forth. What are some tips, some things that we need to think about as scholars and as community leaders? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, yeah, so there's several. I mean, one of the things I show in the book is, is how difficult this work is, right? Um, building power, building coalitions. You know, the, the idea of a, of a democratic coalition on the left and within the left wing of the party in the 1960s um, came along pretty early, but it took them literally years of negotiation, years of, of, of meetings that blew up in their faces, <laughs> years of, of misunderstanding, years of um, falling apart and coming back together before they were able to create an actual working coalition by, by 1963. So I think that's one thing. We have to be patient with ourselves. Yeah. Um, and, and understand that it is a it's a it's a learning process for everyone involved, um, and that you know that's why when people people leave their houses and, and work together, they engage in that that learning to you know collectively a social learning of of how to how to better um, confront uh, the world around them, who's on their side, who's not, right? Um, so yeah, first and foremost, it, you know it's a long process. We can't think of black, brown, and and white. Coalition building is automatic, is natural, um, is inevitable. Also, but also not as impossible, right? Um, yeah, right. You know that, right. that it's there's a continuum, and 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 really, it's a it's a process. It's it's about uh, one of the one of the members, uh, one of the characters in the book mentions coalitioning as a gerund, right? It's a process that's ongoing, and I think that's still the case today. You know, um, I think everybody. Um, Everybody understands that um, you know the the carceral state and and the need for decarceration, the need to fight police brutality. Um, that that that's an issue that affects African Americans as well as other people of color and others. Um, you know that there are connections between that and say the the deportation machine and, and yeah. the incarceration of immigrants and and their expulsion and, and there's connections between those things and. Um, you know the conquest and genocide of, of the the first inhabitants of these areas uh, you know on whose land we reside um but that doesn't mean uh so 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 the, those connections exist right um but that that folks fighting for say immigrant rights aren't an expert on those other things that's not part of their experience um it's not part of their their home their their base community right um and so it, they have to go and proactively learn from these other movements by inserting themselves in there and listening and uh, and being humble and, and 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 a process of give and take. And I think that's, you know, the other, I think point I try to drive home in the book is particularly for white liberal activists, right? Who possess a certain degree of privilege and power that they generally don't acknowledge. Yeah. Right? Their, their position in, in, in supporting social change is, is particularly fraught. And, um, and it, that, you know, one of the themes of this book is is the failure of white liberals to listen <laughs> repeatedly, right? And right. Um, and the fact that the moment at which they were most successful historically was the moment in which they they did sit down and shut up and and start listening and and really deferred to the leadership of black and brown communities, really put civil rights issues front and center, um, abandoned their senses of gradualism their senses of, of right and they and they really tried to um, decenter their own experiences right and and um, and and take their cues from the folks who are most affected by racism the right. folks who are most affected by economic injustice um, by political powerlessness um, and 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 when they did when they made that switch suddenly things took off right suddenly they were organizing lots of people um, when they hired black and brown staff people to do the organizing when they Put those positions, you know, first and foremost on their documents. Everything, right? Things took off, and and so I think that's a clear lesson for today, right? The Democratic Party Absolutely. in Texas, um, you know, first off, who knows if the Democratic Party will ever be anybody's salvation, right? But to the extent that that it's going to produce positive social change, you know, um, we still are in a situation, I think, where many uh, many white leaders uh, who consider themselves liberals. You know, are fundamentally um, struggling with uh, having to um, share leadership and ownership with folks who don't look like them. Yeah, um, that's still a problem, and um, it's a problem in the community where I live, right? Where we have a yeah. black woman running for mayor, and she's fantastic, and she's not getting the support she should be getting from from white Democrats, and uh, and you know, so we got we have a real fight here. Um, 
but I think, you know, I think those are the key things, trying to, uh, you know, really immerse oneself in those other struggles, learn from each other, give it time, um, and really recognize folks coming from different places. You know, um, if, the, if the Democrats want to turn Texas blue, they're going to need it to do more than just wait on demographic change, right? Which is, right. oh yeah, you know, one of the things I found researching the book were these do- these memos from the 1950s that read identical to the stuff you see today, right? About how demographics are going to change and the Democrats are going to win and whatever. It's like, well, clearly we see intra-ethnic divisions, right, among every group, among Latinos in the valley, right, your home, other yeah. places, yeah, um, and we shouldn't expect sort of automatic solidarity, right? Uh, among any particular group. Um, it, has to, it has to be organized, right? And, and it's gonna have to come from a democratic party that is, is, you know, puts civil rights front and center and not just rhetorically, but at, you know, making anti-racism the core of the party. And that means that there isn't room for certain other attitudes. Right? Yeah. The tent's not that big. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I think, one could argue that the same is true about capital, right? That like, um, you know, and unless it's a labor centered party, I have trouble imagining that there's a real path to victory. Um, right. Right. And, you know, and that's gonna mean sometimes, you know, telling um, Elon Musk that he can't do whatever he wants. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, saying that we're not gonna give every economic incentive to any capitalist with five bucks who's gonna give us 10 jobs Right, like right. But that's not ultimately good for our communities, right? Yeah. Or that old development and gentrification is not ultimately good for our cities, yeah. um, or sprawl into the countryside, right? We need to reimagine some of those economic models, and I think, um, you know, by bringing uh, a, a more diverse, representative group of people to the table as leaders of the future party, whatever it is, yeah. Um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to rethink some of those those core issues and, and make sure we know what it, is, what it is we're fighting for. I hope so, too. The <laughs> book is Blue Texas, The Making of a Multiracial Democratic Coalition in the Civil Rights Era. Professor Max Crockmold, thank you so much for joining us uh, today to talk about it. Um, I can't recommend it uh, enough. The book is great, uh, tells the story of this radical tradition in Texas, but also I think helps us think about how we can imagine a, a building a better community and a better world. So thank you so much for this work and the work that you continue to do, sir. Thank you, appreciate it. And thanks for um, the work you put into this platform in this space. Absolutely, all right, thank you very much. All right.